Thank you very much. Um, it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be here today to discuss my work with you. So our lab is using the, um, a, a plat the iPSCs as a platform for studying the function of human genetic variants. So we've derived iPSCs from hundreds of different individuals. And, and the overarching goal of, of our study is the fact that sequencing human genomes is now very cheap. Anyone can get their genome sequenced. However, by looking at the genomic sequence of an individual, you cannot predict what the phenotypes of that individual will be. And this is largely because there are millions, I think the last count I read was 80 million different variants have been discovered in the human genome. And we have very little knowledge of which of those variants actually are functional. And the ones that we think we know are functional, we have just a primitive understanding of what their functions are. So our goal is to take this bank of iPSCs that we've generated, and we are generating a bunch of different molecular phenotypes, RNA-seq, um, DNA um, methylation, histone um, uh, alterations, modifications, and we're looking to see how genetic variants interplay with these different alterations in these molecular phenotypes with the goal of eventually being able to take our, our new information about the function of DNA variants and in the future be able to use this information to look at the DNA sequence of an individual and predict what type of disease or other trait phenotypes they may have. So the, um, we uh, recruited 274 subjects into our IPSCOR resource, which stands for the IPSC Collection for Omics Research. From their blood, we generated deep whole genome sequence and have called all types of different types of genetic variants, single nucleotide variants, copy number variants, multi-allelic copy number variants. From fibroblasts that we collected from these individuals, we reprogrammed them into iPSCs. And for um, hundreds of these, we have actually derived cardiomyocytes. And again, we're generating a variety of different types of molecular assays and we are aiming to conduct these integrative analyses of these different assays in order to functionally annotate human genetic variants. So we have many studies going on in my lab using the ITSCOR resource and this data that we're generating. And I'm going to describe five such studies. The first one was uh, published earlier this year, so I'll just, I'm just going to briefly touch on it. And it's how we looked at how genetic variation affects gene expression in human iPSCs. And then the remaining talks are really going to be using this bank of um, iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes that we've generated, trying to see does genetic background or how much does genetic background account for variability in these molecular phenotypes. Um, we uh, have interestingly, by looking at these hundreds of different differentiations, been able to determine there's actually a sex bias in the efficiency of being able to generate iPSCs from cardiomyocytes. And then I'll talk about looking at, again, genetic variation and how it affects differential binding of an important cardiac transcription factor, NKX2-5, and how this variation impacts cardiac gene expression as well as disease. And then finally, I would say one of our uh, uh, unexpected findings or another unexpected findings is that we went to look to see how genetic variation is actually affecting the three-dimensional structure of the human genome. And much to our surprise, we found that the three-dimensional structure of the human genome is largely unaffected by genetic variation. So the first study here that was again published a little earlier this year, we collected our individuals from the blood. We did the whole genome sequencing, as I just described, called a variety of different um, uh, uh, types of genetic variants. Uh, from the iPSC, we collected the RNA-seq, and then we looked to see how do the genotypes that an individual has of a particular genetic variant affect the expression level of that gene. And so in our collection of iPSCs, we observed that there were roughly slightly more than 17,000 genes that were expressed. 
and we determined that 5,746 of these genes actually had a common variant associated with the expression level. These are referred to as EQTLs. The majority of the genes were protein coding. However, we also identified pseudogenes, long non-coding RNA, as well as antisense, all of which had variants associated with their expression levels. Interestingly, we identified very important genes involved in pluripotency, such as PAL5F, which encodes for OCT4, CXCL5. Again, depending on the variant that an individual carries, it determines their relative expression level. Now, um, I said we are interested in annotating the function of these variants. So we looked for putative regulatory variants, and this actually stands for putative um, expression quantitative trait nucleotide, the nucleotide that's actually underlying the EQTL. And so to identify these PEQTNs, we took our um, lead EQTLs and we overlaid them with uh, 40 trans, um, transcription factor chip e seq experiments from H1 uh, human embryonic stem cell, which we were able to download from the uh, ENCODE. And so by overlapping these two data sets and looking to see which of the variants, you see all of these variants here are actually um, significantly associated with the expression of uh, MED30 gene, which is uh, in an interval on chromosome 8. However, when we did this, we found only one of them actually was in a transcription factor, peak CBPP, and disrupted the um, motif, the binding motif of this transcription factor. And furthermore, when you look at the chromatin states as indicated by chrome HHM, it's in a weak promoter. And so we uh, feel that this is probably the causal pool variant and it's referred to as a putative regulatory variance. And we were able to do this type of analysis for um, and identify 3,140 putative regulatory variants and propose why they were actually um, associated with the differential expression. Um, again, I told you that we also identified copy number variants. We had uh, 247 genes whose expression levels were actually associated with a copy number variant EQTL, 90 of which were multi-allelic CNVs. And I'm showing you this one here on chromosome 2. It's a 2KB uh, multi-allelic copy number variant. And when you look at the individuals, the diploid copy number in our individuals ranged from 1 to 8. So some people had only one copy of this 2KB copy number variant, and others had up to eight. And importantly, when you looked at this, what you saw is that the expression levels of eight different genes in this interval were actually affected by, deter by how many diploid copy numbers of this CNV the individual had. And when you actually look to see where it lies, it lies in a CBBP um, transcription factor peak. When you look at the chrome HHMM, it's lying in a strong enhancer. And so what this is actually indicating is that these multi-allelic CNVs, what they can actually do is they can regulate the expression of the genes by altering the number, the amount of um, a regulatory element that's present in the human genome. And so we're continuing looking at these data, um, again, integrating the variety of different types of molecular phenotypes that we have, um, hoping to um, continue to, in more fine-grained matters, be able to functionally annotate human genetic variants. All right, so now I'm going to uh, move on to where we are looking at and analyzing the bank of iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes that we've generated. And so um, for 181 subjects in the IPSCore resource, we have um, attempted to differentiate them into um, iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes. And an important point that we'll have in a couple slides, um, well, this point will be important, in this particular collection, we have five monozygotic twin pairs embedded. So out of our 258 attempted differentiations of 191 lines, so some of these individuals had multiple lines for them, 
Um, we had 178 successful differentiations. And um, so again, several of these lines were successfully differentiated multiple times. We have since um, gotten a, a variety of molecular phenotypes, not only at the P12, which is the data I just described, but also in the monolayer pri just prior to differentiation, and um, it also in the cardiomyocyte. And so to derive these cardiomyocytes, we took an existing protocol and just tweaked it slightly. We came up with an automated way of determining when the monolayer would be at the correct confluency, so we could just go in there and start the differentiation at the correct time because the actual level of confluency was very important. We tweaked uh, a, a, a key chemical component, and importantly, we added a lactate purification step, and uh, cardiomyocytes are one of the few cell types that can use lactase as a uh, fuel source, and so just by adding this, we were able to uh, purify the population. We've got uh, millions and millions of cells for uh, most of our derivations, and we were able to freeze them down, and we're now using them for other studies. Importantly, many of the lines had uh, percent CNTs greater than 90 percent. We defined anything with a CTNT greater than, I believe, 35 percent as, as a successful differentiation. But they obviously had to have other criteria also. And as you can see from this short video, the iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes spontaneously beat. Um, and also looking at here at the immunofluorescence, we have the, a, a derived cardiomyocyte and um, a human ventricle. You're looking at the immunofluorescence in red of alpha alkanin, showing that we have striated um, um, uh, muscle structures. And looking at the green connexin 43, you're looking to see that we actually have um, intercellular connections being formed. But importantly, we also have the derived cardiomyocytes express genes that are characteristic of cardiac tumors. So what we're looking at here is a principal component analysis where we're looking at the 10,000 most uh, differentially expressed genes in these cell types here, including our iPSCs, our derived cardiomyocytes, and we have a time course that we conducted here of the derivation and roadmap ESCs, iPSCs, and human hearts. So these were derived from the public resource. And what's separating the iPSCs from the um, IP, uh, derived cardiomyocytes when you do a GO analysis is it's not too surprising that the iPSCs uh, have uh, genes being expressed for stem, stem cell population maintenance. The derived cardiomyocytes have cardiac muscle tissue development. What's also not too surprising when you look at the difference between our derived cardiomyocytes and heart tissues is that some of the difference here is being, um, a, actually a, a small a part is being derived from a system development type of analyses. And interestingly, the large part is due to immune response. So when you're looking at the RNA-seq of the heart tissues, what you're not only looking at is from the cardiomyocyte, but also supporting structures. And there's a lot of immune cells in these heart tissues. So um, the cardiomyocytes, derived cardiomyocytes, also have enhancers, which are highly similar to those that are formed in the fetal heart. So we have H3K27 acetylation and attack seek. So the, we have chip seek peaks and we have attack seek peaks, and these are markers for enhancers. And um, we looked at the 25 uh, chromatin states across the 127 uh, roadmap samples, and we looked for the highest similarity um, with where our peaks overlapped for these two marks. And we came up with the um, highest uh, similarity coefficient with actually enhancers in the fetal heart for both the H3K27 acetylation chip seek peaks and the attack seek chip seek peaks indicating that the enhancers in these derived cardiomyocytes are most similar to those present in the fetal heart. So now it's really important because, again, what, I'm, what we've generated this resource to do is to annotate human genetic variants. 
So it's very important for us to know how much of the variability in the molecular phenotypes that we're looking at is actually associated with genetic variants. This is a, a key question. And so we used a study which we refer to as the inter-intra-variability sub-study. We had five monozygotic twins. From the various twin pairs, we um, isolated between um, two to six different IPSC clones, which we derived into the cardiomyocytes. And so for the IPSCs, as well as for the derived cardiomyocytes, you can see that for some of the clones, we differentiated them multiple times, up to three times, and for other clones, we only did once or twice. But <clears throat> what this allowed us to do is to look to see where is the variability arising from. So if we have one, the same clone that has been differentiated multiple times, the variability that we see in expression between these different derivations is due to experimental noise. If it's from uh, multiple lines from the same subject or multiple lines from the identical twin, i.e. the same genetic background, that source of variation is not genetic, but we're not sure what it is. It's some type of noise. However, when we look to see the, um, the differences between people with different genetic backgrounds, then we can attribute that variation to genetics. And so now looking at that, I'm showing you the similarity between four different sets that we're looking at. The light blue is the uh, similarity when we have the same clone that has been differentiated multiple times. The uh, dark blue is the same person, um, but different clones. And the green is the um, same genetic background, i.e. we're looking at uh, clones from the twins. And the white is when we're looking at unrelated individuals. And you can see that we, we see a significant difference and this is well known for the IPSCs now for several years, that the genetic background is actually driving the majority of the variation in molecular phenotypes. What wasn't known is for the derived cardiomyocytes, and there's a much more heterogeneity in the derived cardiomyocytes than there is in the IPSC. But fortunately, to a less extent, but to an extent which is uh, sufficient for us to conduct genotype phenotype studies, we are able to see that the genetic background is still driving the majority of the molecular phenotype variability, um, which is good because I, I would have been highly disappointed if that wasn't the case by this, at this point in time. So we will be able to use this resource for generating for the genotype phenotype studies, that especially the ones similar to what I described for the um, human IPSCs. Now, a byproduct of generating these derived cardiomyocytes was we looked to see what were some of the factors that might be associated with a successful differentiation? So we looked at the age of the subject, the ethnicities of the individuals, the passage number at which we started the differentiation, and to our surprise, the only thing that came up as being significantly different was the gender of the individuals. Males, IPSCs derived from males were significantly less likely to have a successful differentiation than those IPSC lines derived from females. And so this led us to question, how about X inactivation? Because the difference between men and women, as everyone in this room is well aware, is the XY chromosomes. So we wanted to know if IPSC lines that had reactivated that second chromosome would be more likely to have a successful differentiation than IPSC lines derived from females that had not had that second chromosome reactivated. And so I'm just going to describe a little bit of what we're looking at here. This is a single IPSC line, and these are genes that have been reactivated. Both alleles are expressed, and these are genes that have not been reactivated. Only one allele is expressed, and we determine this by looking at the allelic imbalance fraction. As expected on the autosomes, most instances, both alleles are expressed. So now we're looking at here, each row is one of 215 IPSC lines. 
and the lines down in this line area have both um, chromosomes active. Most of the genes have both alleles being expressed. And the ones up here have um, the X, inactivated X has not yet been active, reactivated, and therefore most have only one gene being expressed. And this is the um, pattern that you expect to see for the autosomes where most of the genes have, are being expressed, most alleles are being expressed. And this is concordant with the exist expression levels where it's low in these lines and higher in these lines. Now, when we actually look to see, is the X chromosome reactivation associated with uh, cardiomyocyte differentiation success? I'll tell you the punchline, yes it is. So here, in the blue, light blue, we're looking at IPSC who had uh, um, a successful differentiation outcome, and in the dark blue, those that had an unsuccessful differentiation outcome. And we're looking at a density plot of the allelic imbalance fraction, and what you can see is the ones that successfully differentiated were significantly more likely to have the X chromosome reactivated. So we don't actually know what's going on with this. This is an observation that we saw. We're, we're not sure of what the underlying biology is. Oh, I thought I'd move that. I guess I hadn't. Um, for the sake of time, I wasn't going to talk about that. But, you know, I will. Why not? Um, so the, the, another interesting thing is we wanted to know is the X chromosome becoming reactivated as we derive the cardiomyocytes? And what we observed here by adding the pink line on is that no, they are not. So the cardiomyocytes have the highly, highly similar X in, um, chromosome inactivated state as the iPSCs do. So it's not changing during the differentiation. It's not becoming reinactivated. So I'm next going to move on and talk about how genetic variation is associated with differential um, binding of NKX2-5, again, an important cardiac transcription factor. So to do this, we actually um, looked at in the IPSCOR resource, we have all types of ways of doing genetic studies, and one of them is we have um, embedded in the study um, uh, large generational families. And this is a subset of one of those families, so we have seven individuals across three generations. And we have all the molecular data that we had before, but we also looked at the NKX2-5 chip seq data. And so what we're looking at is you know, when NKX2-5 binds a DNA segment, does it, if it binds one allele more strongly than the other, that's what we're interested in looking at. And we read this out as allele-specific effects. And so when we look at the, D, um, the sequence reads, what we'll see is we'll see more reads aligning to the allele that has a stronger affinity for the binding of this transcription factor than the allele that doesn't. And again, we refer to this as allele-specific effects, and I'm going to talk about ASE for, the, for I think, rest, the rest of my talk, actually. I'll be referring to that. And it's just we find this by looking at the differential counts of sequence reads. And so we wanted to know how many of the NKX2-5 chip peaks actually showed ASC. So we combine the data across all the heterozygous um, subjects at all the, in all the CHIP-seq peaks. And for NKX2-5, we actually identified about 1,400 sites that showed allele-specific effects. Um, this was more, substantially more, than the other molecular phenotypes that we looked at. And we wanted to make sure that it was actually inherited. We wanted to make sure that this wasn't some other type of uh, variable noise that was causing this differential binding. And so we took a, 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 um, advantage of the fact that in our three-generational family, we had two embedded quartets. And so when the offspring were both heterozygous at a site and the parents were homozygous at the site, we looked at the data. 
and we looked at the maternal allele frequency in the het children versus the ratio of the mother to father abundance, and we saw a significant correlation, again, indicating that this differential binding at the NKX2 sites was being inherited. So we wanted to know what was actually underlying this differential binding. So we looked at motif scores, but not only of NKX2-5, but at also of nine different important cardiac transcription factors. And so we looked to see if the allele that resulted in the motif having a high binding, uh, predicted binding score versus the allele that resulted in the motif having a low uh, transcription factor binding score. Um, if indeed that was concordant with our data, and most of the time it was. So the, the allele that bound NKX2-5 was most likely to have a high predicted motif score. Um, importantly, um, this was not always true. Um, and also, it frequently happened that the variant affected the binding site of a different transcription factor. And by the cooperative binding with NKX2-5 is how we saw this differential expression of NKX2-5. Now, the NKX2-5 sites that we observed as having these allele-specific effects were enriched for GWAS hits for cardiographic traits. I'm showing you seven of these, and I'm actually only going to focus on, in on one. This particular variant underlying a NKX2-5 allele-specific effect, RS7612445, um, had, um, it had a very high ASC. It was a GWAS hit for heart rate. The closest gene was GNB4. And in GTEx database, it's also an EQTL for the GNB4 gene. Now, looking at our family that's color-coded, you'll see that the, the grandfather and the aunt actually have a um, variant, the T, causing a different allele and actually resulting, resulting in um, NKX2-5 binding. The other individuals do not really have that much binding at all. When you actually look at the site, what you'll notice is that this T results in the generation of a TBX5 binding site. And so it's this binding site and then probably the cooperative binding of the NKX2-5 that we're observing. And not only does that result in altered NKX2-5 site in our data, but also altered gene expression. So again, this is examples of how we're utilizing these data to functionally annotate genetic variants. And now, <laughs> lastly, we set out to look at how genetic variation affects the 3D chromatin architecture of the human genome. Now, as I'm sure most people in this room are well aware of, the human genome is organized in a very complex way. And what I'm going to focus on here is looking at chromatin loops. So there are these loop structures in the human genomes, and what these allow is it allows things that are distant apart from one another, like a, regulate, a regulatory element and the promoter of a gene to come in close proximity to one another. It's known that there are CTCF um, binding sites here, and it's known that these genes can be um, regulated. And as we've been talking about, RNA genes have allele-specific effects. So one copy is frequently expressed much higher than the other, as I've shown previously. And we set out to see, is this differential RNA expression associated with differential loops? All right, so is there actually different binding in the loops? <clears throat> so um, working uh, with Bing Ran, um, uh, we generated RNA-seq data for our uh, 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 the family that I talked about in the last, okay, here we go, um, in, the, in the last study. And we generated, um, for both the cardiomyocytes as well as the iPSCs, we generated um, multiple HiC libraries. And then we actually ended up combining all of these data, six billion reads, um, analyzed these data, uh, using standard methods in the field, fit high C and hiccups to call loop structures. Um, we found different loops 
different numbers of loops, and we found specific cell type loops. So there are iPSC cell type specific loops and derived cardiomyocyte cell type specific loops, and there is differential expression in these differential loops. I'm not going to talk about that. What, I'm, what I am going to talk about here is how we used all the data that we had to phase the variance in these individuals. So we used whole genome sequence data, family information, high C data, and we came up with all the variants in, the, uh, in their genomes and assigned them to either the paternal haplotype or the maternal haplotype. And so we were able to do this across the whole genome. And then for each loop in each individual, we calculated the haplotype and um, balance using a binomial test and then combine these data across all seven individuals using a Fisher test. And we identified 114 imbalanced chromatin loops. So out of the, you know, 20,000 chromatin loops that we identified in both the cell types, this is a, a, a small fraction of those we're showing imbalance. So, um, of those 114 loops, most of them were shared between the two cell types. There were some that were um, present in a, the cardiomyocyte-specific loop or an iPSC-specific loop, but um, the vast majority were loops that were present in both cell types. And what we're looking at here is for one individual, the iPSC maternal to paternal ratio in the, um, versus the cardiomyocyte maternal to paternal ratio. And um, the color coding here is indicating whether it's um, present in both or one or the other. But what's important is you see that they're highly correlated. So there's not much difference in the imbalance loops between cell types. So allelic difference in chromatin loops are consistent across the cell types. And now <clears throat> there had been a variety of different features that had been published as being associated with imbalanced chromatin loops in the field, uh, such as imprinted genes in uh, CNVs or, or RNA um, ASE allele-specific effects. So we looked to see, are these things associated with these imbalanced loops in our data set? And indeed, we saw that they were. The blue is the um, um, Imbalance chromatin loops in the green are all, all the loops that we observed. But we were wondering what, we were thinking with the few number of imbalanced loops that we saw, they couldn't actually be accounting for the vast amount of RNA ASC that we observed. So we looked to see was there a correlation between these? Um, are the imprinted genes actually responsible, uh, is the association of the imprinted genes with the imbalanced loops actually underlying the association of the RNA ASC with the imbalanced loops? And so looking over here, this is the uh, uh, p-value, the log 10 of the p-value, and anything to the right of the loop is significant. So to the right of the loop is where we have our 114 imbalanced loops. And on the y-axis, what we're looking at is the odds ratio for the enrichment of RNA ASC within a loop. And we do see, in, in, in the light blue here, we're looking at all genes, and we do see that there is a strong association between the a, um, ASC and within the chromatin loops. But if we remove all the imprinted genes, this goes away quite a bit, all right? So what this is indicating is that the previous observations of RNA-ASC with imbalanced loops is primarily associated with or explained by the association of genetic imprinting with imbalanced loops, and has not, and it has probably little to do with altered regulation of the um, uh, transcriptome. And then finally, this is my last slide here. Um, we look to see, again, CTCF is known to be present at m the majority of the anchors forming these chromatin loops. So the majority of the anchors forming these chromatin loops. 
And so we looked at, we looked at CTCF, chip seek imbalance or allele specific effects, again, by looking for differential read counts depending on the allele that we're looking at. And um, what we um, looked at, again, this is for a um, single individual here, is we looked at um, the loop. So this is loop imbalance for the maternal haplotype frequency versus CTCF um, imbalance for the maternal um, uh, haplotype frequency. And you'll note there is a correlation. But the extreme ends here, and I should actually have them indicated, these are largely imprinted genes. What you'll observe is the majority of the CTCF that has allele-specific effects or imbalanced, meaning one allele binds CTCF more strongly than the other, are not resulting at all in imbalanced loops. And this is just another way of looking at this. This is the alleloc imbalance ratio threshold when we look at the number of features. You'll see that this is the ratio. So this would be a CTF site where one allele binds nine. You know, we see for every 90 reads we see a one allele, we see 10 of the other, all right? And you don't see any loops really at, with, at that in, grade of imbalance. You begin to see some loops with that type of imbalance when we're looking at an 80 uh, uh, threshold of 80 or 70, but nothing compared to what we're looking at for the CTCF. So allele-specific effects with CTCF is really not indicative or not associated with this chromatin loop imbalance that we're observing. So <clears throat> I'm going to summarize um, the, my presentation here. We've generated this IPSCore resource for uh, conducting studies of human genetic variants to try to determine which ones are functional and what their functions are. Um, I described how we are able to derive cardiomyocytes in bulk and that we, um, these cardiomyocytes are pretty good uh, recapitulating real human cardiomyocytes at both RNA expression and epigenetic profiles. When we looked at the differentiations that we conducted, both the successful and unsuccessful differentiations, we saw that there was a significant correlation with both gender as well as X chromosome reactivation status on whether or not the iPSC would be able to have a successful differentiation into the cardiomyocytes. <clears throat> this was significantly significant statistically significant, although one would have had to have done as, com as many. Again, remember, I, we did 258 attempted differentiations. You almost have to have had those type of numbers to observe this type of bias. The, um, I, I hope I was able to convince you that we will be able to use these cardiomyocyte lines as a model system for examining the role of genetic variants in cardiomyocytes as well as we're currently um, starting to derive other types of cell types to do similar studies in uh, different um, cellular backgrounds. And then um, our surprise finding that the 3D um, chromatin architect is minimally affected by genetic variants. So the 3D chromatin architect varies between cell types somewhat. However, within the same cell type, it's relatively unvariable between different humans. And we showed that the imprinting explains most of the association that has been reported to date between chromatin loop variability and RNA ASE, and that um, allele specific effects or differential binding of CTCF at the loop anchors are not indicative of loop imbalance. And I would like to thank the members of my lab. The individuals here indicated in uh, blue all had posters today. There we are in sunny San, San Diego, which nevertheless prevented us from thoroughly enjoying the solar eclipse that happened a month or so ago. Um, I'd also like to thank the Bing Ren Lab for um, their uh, collaboration with us in the um, generating the high C data and my collaborators at the Salk Institute, Juan Carlos Balmonte, and um, especially Travis Bergen, who um, helped or who actually was the uh, 
force behind actually making the IPSCs for us. And so, and last but not least, my funding sources. So thank you very much. All right, uh, open for questions. Fascinating, Kelly. So I had a question about the imbalance loops. Have you looked at exist expression along those loops to see if there is an imbalance of exists? No, but what I, what I did want to know is if this was somehow indicative of, um, and so I talked about imprinting in the last part, so, but we also looked at imprinting and I did not talk about it. So we looked at imprinting genes to see as the X chromosome reactivated, did, was imprinting lifted also, mm -hmm. right? And we did not see an association between um, lifting of imprinted genes and the ability to differentiate. So what I'm really alluding to is maybe EXIST has another function on autosomes. And it, you know, we always think of it as an imprinting related long non-coding RNA, but I'm actually wondering if it has a tethering function that normally we would think of as, as uh, CTCF specific. And it, maybe it's a little knot that it ties. I'm just, just a So I, um, I thought it was a great talk, but I didn't really get a sense of when you looked at NK, uh, whatever it is. NKX2-5. X2-5 binding in the cardiomyocytes versus TBX binding and so on. What proportion of the variants that you saw directly affected uh, NKX2.5 binding versus affected something else in the, in the same enhancer and affected binding of a sort of cooperating transcription factor? What were the rel relative percentages? So off the top of my head, I would say it was about 70% affected the NKX2-5 sites. Directly? Yeah. So it actually was a nucleotide variation or substitution in the binding motif itself? Yeah. Wow. I do have a follow-up question on the X inactivation. I mean, that's crazy. So you, you, you think that just by reactivating both X chromosomes, it favors the differentiation. But both chromosomes remains active throughout the differentiation. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. And um, Joe Wu, who is actually a cardiac biologist and at Stanford, um, before I had these data, uh, you know, we were talking, I, I'm coming at this completely as a human geneticist, genomicist, right? right. So he actually understands cardiac biology, but he, he was saying, you know, Kelly, what I've observed is I've observed this association between IPSC lines that are, you know, beyond day, or beyond passage 25 in the ability to differentiate. Hmm. And I thought, okay, hmm. When we saw these data, I realized that he had probably from a completely different angle, right, he probably wasn't realizing. I mean, I think it's kind of known that X, and act, X reactivation occurs as IPSC lines are right. passaged, but I don't think he quite, he hasn't put the dots together that it's that step that is, is most likely accounting for that more successful differentiation of the older IPSC lines. I see, so those were all done at higher passage. No, I mean, so I try to do, uh, you know, uh, as part of doing this scale so I can look at genetic variation, the only way you can look at genetic variation is if you try to hold as best as humanly possible all other experimental conditions solid, right? And so we try to do the differentiation sometime between passage 22 and 27, okay. 28, but sometimes they're earlier and sometimes they're later. Yeah. But even at the same passage, although passage is associated with X chromosome activation, not, it's, it's, it's not like you know, at, at passage 25, all lines are gonna have right. this much. Does that make sense? There's variation yeah. Yeah. there. Yeah. We see the same, I mean, uh, it's relevant because lots of uh, uh, conditions where, uh, such as intellectual disabilities in the X chromosome, we work with patient cells, female cells, and then we observe this uh, chromosome erosion, right? So the, the X chromosome becomes active after several passages. I never thought that this would be linked to a facilitation on, on the differentiation aspect. 
Uh, right. Uh, there is one more question over there. In terms of differentiation, uh, uh, success in differentiation to the cardiomyocytes, I can't remember on your slide if you had looked at um, donor age. Um, we looked at age, and we did not see an association. So if no more questions, I think we uh, reached the end of our symposium. I will thank the speakers. Thanks, Kelly. And we have the network and poster sections outside. Thank you, guys. Thank you.